there's no reason that it, it needs to be. Um, the, the basic principles of, uh, of brain imaging are, are fairly simple. The traces that we use are all uh, fairly simple in their physiology as well. Um, to begin with, we have the perfusion agents, which uh, HMPAO and ECD, you know, the most commonly uh, used ones. They're pretty much interchangeable. There are some slight differences in their uh, uh, in, in, the out, in the appearance of the images. With the uh, ECD, you get a little bit better uh, signal to background ratio. With HMPAO, the, the main advantage there is that the uptake at very high flow levels is more proportional to the level of flow. So in patients that have um, high uptake lesions, like in epilepsy, for example, um, you have a little bit more sensitivity in, in um, finding those lesions with the um, with HMPAO. But it's really you know, just a marginal difference. Cerebral infarction, I'll start out with uh, cerebral vascular imaging. Um, infarcts that are acute, that is up to three days, are, are seen, first of all, in, in our perfusion imaging scan. You can see that before anything on CT, um, and so it's actually very early, uh, it's very useful for early infarcts. Uh, <coughs> my pointer is dead. Okay, wait, it's back again, it's back again. Okay, so infarcts are obviously gonna appear as an area of decreased perfusion. And the, air, the, the effect that you see may be quite larger than what you see on the CT. That's because we're looking at something called an ischemic penumbra. Now that's very important because this represents an area that's at risk for, for further infarction. It's still viable brain tissue, um, but the infarct can expand and cover that whole area, leading to a drastic consequences for the patient. Subacute infarcts uh, up to three weeks, uh, we're gonna see. Uh, this is difficult for us to image. CT is very good in this uh, time frame. But what we sometimes will see was what we call luxury perfusion. That's when the vessel reopens, and now because you've damaged all of the vessels and all the, the cells around there, um, you are going to have a, a, a failure of the normal autoregulation in that system, in that part of the brain, so you can have a uh, paradoxical increase in perfusion where you have a, a defect uh, in the acute phase. Now this can last for uh, several weeks, and during that time period, our sensitivity for looking at these is, is decreased. You don't see this in every case, but it can it can be a limiting problem. Um, and then chronic uh, in chronic cases, we're going to see a decrease in perfusion once the luxury perfusion is gone. Um, so here's an example of a, of a of a brain, and you can see here in this posterior parietal area. This is this is the, the um, actually the subacute phase. Um, you can see an area of decreased perfusion there. Um, actually, that's this moy moy disease, but this, that was the reason for it. But you see, it has an infarct um, in this part of the brain, and that's, that's the cause of it. Now, the diet, we sometimes uh, supplement the uh, imaging uh, with a Diamox study. Diamox is a cetazolamide, it's an inhibitor of carbonic anhydrase. Remember back to basic uh, pharmacology. Um, it, it, it essentially, it's going to cause the carbon dioxide to accumulate uh, within the brain, and uh, that affects the autoregulatory uh, system for the perfusion, and so it increases the blood flow. Uh, some people say it's <coughs> three to four times above baseline. It's, that's probably um, an exaggeration. In reality, it's, most patients going to be one and a half to probably twice the baseline flow. Comparison to the baseline study then will show areas of diminished vascular reserve. This is just like you do with myocardial imaging, which Dr. Carly will talk about in a minute. Um, you know, you can, there you identify areas of ischemia. Here we call it diminished cerebrovascular reserve. So these patients, uh, particularly patients with TIAs or patients that have had, uh, a stroke, you can show that the, um, the, uh, they may re-stroke, they have another area that may have a stroke, or patients with TIAs may have an impending stroke in this area of the brain. Um, here's an example of a patient diamox study. This is the baseline here. This is the diamox study. Um, there's really not a, a lot of difference between the two of them. So this patient had a, pretty much a, a stable uh, lesion there. Just some very minor differences between the two. Now, um, to move on to the, idea, the concept of uh, dementia imaging, this is actually a, a pretty big area of interest right now. and. Um, the, uh, dementia, is, is, especially in the elderly population, is becoming uh, recognized more and more as a very widespread um, disease, a high prevalence. Uh, Alzheimer's disease, you see a diffuse atrophy throughout the cerebral cortex. It changes at the microscopic level um, uh, with position within the uh, brain. Uh, 
Those things are seen normally in aging, but in Alzheimer's disease, they're seen in a much more, uh, uh, for Alzheimer's disease, the, the main finding that you're going to be looking for is here in the uh, posterior temporal parietal association cortex. That's the, uh, the uh, pretty much the, the paradigmatic area uh, for that. You sometimes may see something also in the posterior cingulate where you have some decreased perfusion, um, but that's variable, and I wouldn't rely on that. This is the main finding here. Uh, the, the thing to look for is right next to this is the primary motor and sensory cortex and anterior to it, and you should see a very sharp cutoff right there because this is usually preserved in patients that have Alzheimer's. And this is how you can differentiate, say, an MC uh, vascular lesion from Alzheimer's disease because Alzheimer's does not progress uh, anteriorly uh, the way a vascular lesion would. Um, perfusion in the, in the basal ganglion thalamus is usually fairly normal as well as the perfusion of the brainstem. So this shows you what the the paradigmatic area is. It's right here in this posterior, temporal, and parietal area. And here's an example, that's a case. Um, and you can see here, here's the primary uh, motor strip right here. You can see it right there. You can see how sharp the cutoff is. There's usually a fairly sharp cutoff also of the occipital lobe, because this is also not affected um, by Alzheimer's. Another common type of dementia is the frontotemporal type. And Pick's disease is one member of the group uh, diseases, um, but there are a number of others, and I won't really go into all the details of this. The main thing is to recognize the difference between a frontotemporal versus an Alzheimer's disease. And the frontotemporal, um, well, which picks here as the example, you're going to have selective atrophy of the anterior parts of the brain. That's the frontal lobe and the anterior part of the temporal lobe. And this is what it looks like uh, on the 3D image. This is the area of abnormality here. So that's what you're looking for. It's usually very easy to tell the difference between uh, frontotemporal disease and uh, Alzheimer's. This is how it looks on the scan. You can see now the ratio of uh, uptake in the frontal lobe to the occipital lobe is very much decreased and, uh, and the frontotemporal dementia. Usually you don't have to describe it any further than that because once you've done that, uh, the clinicians have, uh, and the neurologists know what to do with that. You don't have to say Alzheimer's versus some other form of frontal dementia. Uh, I, I mean, uh, Pick's disease. So they just they want to make the differential against Alzheimer's or vascular disease like this. Vascular cognitive impairment is um, should be a little bit more controversial, perhaps, than it is right now. What you're going to look for in the scan are uh, multiple, usually asymmetric areas that are focal, that have decreased uh, flow. Um, and here's an example of that. You've got small defects um, in different parts of the brain, here and here and here and here. And so that's considered um, uh, consistent with uh, vascular cognitive impairment. The, the, the problem here is that pathologically that doesn't uh, necessarily bear out. These cortical defects here are really not the ones that seem to be that important in the etiology of the disease, but they are probably risk factors for it. Um, so. Um, so we, we still go on uh, making the differential. Epilepsy imaging, another common indication for brain scans. Um, the kind of epilepsy we're looking at is, is complex partial seizures. There are all many kinds of epilepsy. Most of them are handled by the clinicians without us. The reason why we come into play uh, here is because we're trying to identify patients who are candidates for surgical correction. And so they, the most common pathology for these patients is something called mesial temporal sclerosis. It's a scarring of the temporal lobe. And so we're looking for a unilateral, surgically accept, accessible focus uh, that can be uh, uh, treated. Um, there, there are different ways to do this imaging. You can image the patient while they're having a seizure. That is the gold standard. Uh, and you can image the patient after they've had a seizure, immediately after, with what's called periictal imaging, which is um, uh, very difficult to interpret. And then you can do interictal imaging, which is a patient not having a seizure at this time, and hasn't had one at all uh, within the last uh, day or so. And uh, this is the best imaging method. You can only use SPECT on this. You can't use PET with this because uh, it takes 20 minutes or more for the PET agent to be taken up in the brain, and the seizure is long gone by the time you do that. So those are always periectal uh, scans, if you're lucky, to inject FDG at the time the patient's having a um, seizure. The sensitivity is 85 to 95% with good technique on these patients. Um, and you're looking for areas of increased perfusion, increased perfusion, uh, which are going to be focal and unilateral. You need to inject the tracer within 60 seconds of the onset of the seizure. 
So what we do is we make up the dose, have it up on the floor, the patient's being monitored up there for a seizure. As soon as the seizure you know, the alarm goes off, the nurse runs right in there and injects the tracer immediately. Um, the patient can be imaged then at, at leisure um, hours after that because the tracer doesn't redistribute once it gets into the brain. Interictal imaging is what you do when the patient, you can't get the patient to seize um, for one reason or another, and um, the sensitivity here is much lower. It's about 70%. And the specificity is also not very good because what we're looking for now are areas of decreased uptake. So there's some, been some neuronal death in the area of the seizure focus. There's also some hypometabolism due to these exhaustive neurons, and so what you see is decreased activity. For this, you can use either PET imaging or SPECT imaging, and this is actually an approved indication. You can get reimbursed for uh, PET imaging for these patients, but you're doing an interictal scan, and you're looking for hypometabolism or hypoperfusion on either the scan. Uh, so here's an example. This is the interictal study. There is an abnormality here. It's a little bit decreased, but it's very hard to see. A lot of people would, uh, you know, miss it or, or, or spend a lot of time arguing about it. But on the ictal page, you can see there's very clearly an area of increased uh, uptake. So you can see why this is so much better to use than this one. But if you can't do this, um, this does have utility, and so we still do a lot of interictal studies. Brain death, um, I'll say a lot about this. It's a fairly simple study. You inject the patient with some kind of agent. Personally, anything that you have in the laboratory, uh, we use ECD here, uh, but uh, DTPA is also was the first agent approved for this, and essentially anything in the blood uh, can be used in an emergency uh, to do a brain death study. But the, um, it's important to know that the brain death study we do is not diagnostic of brain death. Um, it's only one thing that's used to confirm brain death uh, by the clinicians. That's a clinical diagnosis. Um, diagnosis requires complete absence of arterial and venous uh, activity. You may see a little bit of trivial uh, uptake in the sagittal sinus due to perforator veins, uh, but other than that, there should be no evidence of any activity within any phase of the study. Hot nose sign, you uh, often will see that. It's not necessary to see it. Um, and in case increased blood flow in the central part of the brain because the, the, the blood coming up to the internal carotid needs some way to uh, egress and so it collateralizes to that part of the head. So this is a, a brain death study. You can see that there's just nothing, nothing in the posterior fossa, nothing in the cerebrum. Okay, now I'll move on to Dr. Javado's part of the talk. Uh, and he's talking about uh, this, uh, was, to, was to talk about brain tumors. The uh, radiopharmaceuticals that we use um, are, uh, for this kind of imaging are several. Uh, we have cationic tracers, which essentially thallium is the most important one, um, although uh, system IV has been uh, tried as well and it, it being investigated in a lot of areas, and it, 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 it seems to work pretty well too. Perfusion tracers are um, ECD and HMPO, which is of which um, FEG PET and carbon-11 methionine are the main ones. These are not approved for reimbursement right now, and uh, only these tracers here are approved for reimbursement. Um, these are just imaging protocols that we use at the Brigham for each of these different kinds of uh, tracers. Since the MIBI, uh, we've done a few of these cases, uh, uh, and uh, it's essentially equivalent to the old thallium study. Okay, here's the thallium uh, uh, brain uh, study. Now you notice that you have this uptake here. This is not the cerebral cortex. This is the scalp of the patient. The cerebral cortex is completely black. That's because thallium is, a, is an ion. It does not cross the blood-brain barrier. And in order for it to cross through, you have to have uh, perfusion of that area. You have to have breakdown of the blood-brain barrier. And you have to have uh, metabolic activity causing uh, increased retention of the tracer within the tissue. There's a tumor right here that shows all three of these, these factors. The, the whole beauty of thallium imaging is that you have this very, very excellent uh, uh, lesion to background ratio. This is a, a, a fusion image done, and just to show you the, the location of the, of the tumor. These can be used to guide biopsy, they can be used to grade the tumors, and determine uh, uh, sometimes the differential of the of a tumor, um, meningioma for the tracer that will uh, malignant tumors and then look for tumor recurrence. But particularly, this is the, probably the most common indication to di uh, distinguish the tumor recurrence from radiation necrosis, which may be uh, ambivalent on the, uh, ambiguous on the MRI. Uh, this is just to show a system MIBI case. Uh, 
with tear stallium, and cystamibi. The tumor itself shows similar uptake in both lesions. This is uptake actually in the choroid plexus. It's physiologic uptake, which you see only on the cystamibi scan. So it's a problem with that imaging agent um, if you um, have tumors that are located near the choroid plexus. Um, there are different ways to quantify the tumor uh, grade and viability. There's a, there's a Brigham method that was established uh, quite a few years ago with, uh, by Dr. Holman and his associates. And then there's a, there's a uh, UCLA method. This is the UCLA method where you take a, uh, you look at the ratio of uh, uptake of thallium versus the uh, contralateral part of the brain. And if it's, uh, if it's greater than one and a half, it's probably um, uh, a malignant tumor. If it's less than one and a half, it could be a low-grade tumor or it could be benign. And here he's just uh, showing that, here's a patient with, uh, you can see out here that there's some uh, quite a bit of uh, suspect area here, uh, which involves some tumor and some necrosis. And when you do the thallium scan, you can see that the area of viable tumor is simply this area that's uh, most uh, medial within the tumor. If you're going to biopsy something, you biopsy this part of it, you're going to wind up with just necrotic tissue, and I think you have no recurrence. But if you biopsy the correct part of the, uh, the lesion, then you will have a, um, uh, you'll, you'll see there is recurrence. Um, differentiating tumor from radiation necrosis. High thallium uptake means there's recurrence. Low uptake is <coughs> consistent with radiation necrosis. So um, here are some lesions. This shows, um, uh, we generally pair these. We do a thallium study, more important of the two studies. With that, usually you'll see uh, studies that with a little bit of perfusion in that area, um, but not always. You can actually have decreased perfusion, normal perfusion as well. Um, what we're doing is we have tumor to an extracranial activity. And so the ratio needs to be a bit higher for that. And 3.9 is our cutoff rate. 50, we, when we look at perfusion, we evaluate against the perfusion in the cerebellum, which is fairly uh, constant. And if it's more than half of the, of the cerebellum perfusion, then it's uh, probably a malignancy. And this is just showing you here again. Three and a half is our cutoff. 50% is, is our cutoff for the perfusion part of the imaging. And He's just giving you the, the, the logic of what I just described. If the thallium, if the thallium is over three and a half, it's, it's learned, regardless of what the perfusion says. And if the thallium is below three and a half, the perfusion is high, then it's likely a recurrence. If the perfusion and the thallium are both low, then it's, uh, it's indeterminate or negative. Uh, There's a patient with a GBM and showing uh, Looks like uh, some recurrence in this area here. Here he's showing the, uh, there's a little bit of uh, perfusion extending into the more viable part of that tumor. So this is, the ratio is 4.35 and the perfusion ratio is 53%. Here's another case which has a little bit of uptake right here on the thallium scan. This is that normal uptake, but is it actually a recurrence? And all depends on what the ratio is. Here's 1.35. That's more consistent with radiation necrosis. Now we can evaluate uh, over time the patient not, not responding to therapy and the tumor is getting bigger, as you can see. We can use it for differential diagnosis, particularly um, one, one unique area where we can uh, have a lot of impact is in the differential between toxoplasmosis, uh, abscess, and CNS lymphoma. Both of these things will turn up as uh, ring enhancing lesions on MR on patients that uh, are a, you know, HIV uh, patients. Um, and so the difference is, is that in the uh, CNS lymphoma, there'll be positive thallium uptake, which is that dark area right here. It's just, um, that covers this reverse here. Um, so this is the hot area here, so that's lymphoma. Toxoplasmosis, mm -hmm. on the other hand, um, shows no uh, appreciable thallium uptake. <coughs> And a little bit about FDG imaging. Um, as you know, the brain, the brain uses glucose for all of its energy requirements. Therefore, all of the normal cortical areas and the subcortical nuclei are all going to be very hot just because of the uh, normal utilization of glucose. That contributes to the poor, or shall I say not poor, but decreased um, sensitivity of, uh, of this kind of imaging compared to the thallium. It's because the, the lesion to background ratio is, is uh, very low. <coughs> as opposed to thallium where it's very high. However, FDG uptake correlates uh, pretty well once you see it with the uh, histologic rate of the tumors. 
that is uh, tumors that are low grade, this will be WHO uh, grade two tumors. You have uh, diffuse uh, astrocytomas, fibrillary astrocytomas. Uh, they would generally not show any increased FTG uptake. It's the anaplastic grade three tumors and grade four glioblastomas that will show increased uptake. Uh, and then in children, you have a, a category which is WHO called say, astrocytoma. Yeah. But they, they usually can be uh, distinct by other clinics, not a quantity for us. Um, this is um, here, this, this is the tumor within this patient. Um, you can see how uh, poorly it stands out against the background. You can either confuse this with just a uh, sulcus. And when the sulcus, you know, when you come in there, you see the, the bend of the sulcus, uh, the hairpin. You see also see increased uptake like that. You see that like here, 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 and so on. And so you could easily overlook that. Um, but that, that is the tumor. Here's another one um, right near the uh, primary visual there, and this stands out a little bit better. And here this area of, uh, this patient's been surgically resected, and it looks like there was an area of recurrence there um, on the FTG imaging. Again, here's an area, a small area, looks like recurrence right here. And uh, so FTG, um, it's, it's fairly good. We actually have some neurosurgeons at the Brigham who consistently ask for FTG and we go ahead and give it to them even though right now we aren't getting paid for it. Um, usually it answers the question, when it doesn't, thallium is always available as a, as a standby. Carbonylamine methionine is something uh, very few people can do because you need a cyclotron for this. The, the half time of uh, half life of carbonylamine is very short, just a few minutes. Um, and but it's a good agent. And what it uh, is, is looking at is the protein synthesis shows the, the increased metabolism within the tumor. <coughs> and here's an FTG study shows a little abnormal uptake. But the carbon eleven study, methionine study, um, was much better. And here's some more images here. Um, just showing the difference between, uh, between the two. There's a low grade glioma, FTG imaging, FLT, that's a, a special agent being investigated for uh, tumor proliferation. Doesn't show much there, but, but uh, this agent, Fluoridopa, uh, this, in this experimental study, showed good uptake there. And it's not quite clear why Fluoridopa is being taken up, but uh, it's under intense investigation right now. So, um, just to conclude, PET and SPECT are useful for looking for local recurrence and metastases, treatment uh, assisting, uh, therapy planning, and the effect of therapy. And that's, that's it. Okay. to GI and hepatoid imaging. There's a lot to say here, so I may move uh, uh, pretty fast. Um, Pillary system, uh, you, you all know the anatomy of it, I'm sure. Uh, it's, it's got the uh, common uh, hepatic duct, common bile duct, cystic duct, all of our ampulla of fodder. We're going to be revisiting all these structures in, in the next few minutes. The agents that we use for uh, imaging are all uh, one class of agents called immunodiacetic agent, uh, acid agents. And they're all derived from something called HIDA. That's the classical term. Nobody uses HIDA anymore. We've improved on it in a number of ways, um, but they're still called HIDA scans um, for the sake of uh, inertia, I guess. Uh, Nebrofenin is what we use at the Brigham because it has the best extraction ratio and competes very well against the, the patient's own bilirubin, which is often very high in patients that are being um, sent to us. And this just compares the different agents and shows meprofenin at the half time of hepatic excretion very, very rapid and uh, hepatic uptake is very high. But all these agents are still pretty good. Thysite is a, is a cheaper agent and it's used uh, quite widely still in a lot of institutions. We give, you know, five, a little five milliliters or so to the patients. Start imaging immediately after injection and image for 60 minutes. Um, at the end of 60 minutes, if we haven't seen the gallbladder, we will then give the patient morphine if there's no contraindication to that, uh, and then we'll image for, for another uh, 30 minutes. 
Um, some patients can't get morphine. The alternative to doing that is to re-image at four hours after injection. It doesn't have to be continuous imaging. It's enough to bring them back at four hours and see whether the gallbladder shows up or not. Um, sometimes the duodenum is a problem. I've given in a few cases a little bit of water to these patients and you can sort of wash that out. Um, you'll see when you look at the picture what I, what I mean by that. We use the image in the anterior view and then get spot views at the end in the LAO view because the LAO view separates the gallbladder out better from the cystic duct and the, uh, the, uh, the duodenum. Uh, some people do all their imaging in LAO and then they get a spot view in the anterior view at the end. Um, it's, uh, it's, you know, it's a matter of preference. The normal pattern is uh, the, the, the liver should max out at about 10 to 15 minutes after injection and should rapidly decrease. There should be very little activity in the liver at the end of one hour. You see a lot of liver activity, that's, that's decrease in liver function. Uh, the bile duct you should see very soon within 10 minutes to 30 minutes. The gallbladder then usually fills up within 40 minutes. The study is technically not abnormal uh, if you see the gallbladder any time in the first 60 minutes. If it takes longer than an hour to see it, it could be chronic cholecystitis. Um, but this is not a, a I, I can't emphasize enough that this is not a test for chronic cholecystitis. It's a test for acute cholecystitis. And chronic cholecystitis is a default diagnosis for an abnormal study that turns out not to meet the criteria for acute cholecystitis. There are patients that have a fairly normal uh, initial part of the study and they have chronic cholecystitis as well. We're not diagnosing that. It's not sensitive for that. Uh, it's the default diagnosis. Uh, so the, uh, after you see gallbladder, the duodenum should follow it. Sometimes you'll get a reversal of the sequence by itself the, in the literature that has not been established as a truly uh, abnormal criterion, but it is uh, something to bear, uh, to take notice of, because it can be a sign of chronic cholecystitis if you have other abnormalities within the scan. Uh, prolonged renal uptake uh, is abnormal. There isn't usually much renal uh, excretion. If you see a lot of renal uptake, it means that there is um, some problem with the liver. Either liver failure for any reason or total biliary obstruction, nothing getting out from that uh, mode of egress. So here's a normal HIDA scan. Liver comes up first, maxes out very early. See the intrahepatic duct, cystic duct, now gallbladder, now common bile duct, and lastly, the bowel. Now you see how in the center, in the portal area of the, of the liver in this anterior view, a lot of these structures sort of overlap. The cystic duct and the gallbladder are, can be hard to differentiate. And um, I'll, I'll show you another case later on that will explain the importance of that. Now uh, morphine induces spasm of the sphincter of Odeon, so it increases the, the filling pressure that allows us to in, fill press, uh, a gallbladder that has, say, a thickened wall with poor compliance. So you increase the pressure, you fill it, so that's a chronic, that could be chronic cholecystitis. Um, uh, but if a patient has acute cholecystitis, the cystic duct is, is very tightly occluded by edema or by an impacted stone, and you can't get any filling by any method into it. So we give morphine, 0.04 milligrams per kilogram, that's a standard dose everywhere, um, and then look for the gallbladder. You don't see it within the next half hour or so of imaging, that's acute cholecystitis. If you do see it, then it's chronic cholecystitis. That's because it's an abnormal study if you even have to give morphine. It's by definition abnormal, so you have to call it something, so we call it chronic. Um, the important thing is not to mistake the a dilatation of an obstructed cystic duct for the gallbladder. The cystic duct is very medial, it's near the portal area of the uh, liver, and that's, that's the importance of doing the LAO view, so you can separate those two out. I'll show you uh, a good example in just a minute. Um, we, there are false positives with the study. It's a very, uh, they're a very small group of patients, um, and they're patients that have eaten just before the study. Um, for these patients, you simply wait until four hours or more have elapsed. They have a contracted gallbladder because the endogenous CCK um, was, was uh, secreted after the meal. Patients that have been not eaten within the last 24 hours may have a dilated gallbladder that's already filled up with bile. It's hard to fill this gallbladder. Now, sometimes we will give CCK to these patients in advance of the study. Um, that has to be done carefully. You have to do that um, at least three hours before you do the study. If you give it too soon, uh, too close to the study, the CCK is going to be causing the gallbladder still to be contracted or the sphincter of Odie to be uh, wide open. And so you may get a false uh, positive from that. Um, and then patients that are just uh, very, very sick or getting TPN or anorexic, they will have atonic gallbladders and they also may be false positive.
Now CCK we use in two different ways. Well, I just described one of them. Um, the other is when we're evaluating the gallbladder ejection fraction, the actual function of the gallbladder. It's an endogenous hormone that is normally the regulator of gallbladder emptying. It does several things simultaneously. It causes contraction of the gallbladder, relaxation of the cystic duct, and relaxation of the sphincter of OD. All of that makes sense if you think about it. Um, that's at physiologic doses. If you have super physiologic doses, you will contract the gallbladder and the cystic duct and possibly the sphincter of OD. And what that means is that the gallbladder is contracting against the, cons uh, the constriction and uh, causes pain and nausea. And it also can, you're evaluating the gallbladder ejection fraction and give you an abnormal study. Uh, so we make sure that you don't give too much CCK and don't give it too fast. So what we do is, uh, our dose actually, we give half this now. We've decreased it to 0 0.02 micrograms, not milligrams, micrograms per kilogram um, over a long, very long period of time. We don't always go this long. Sometimes we go now um, four or five minutes of injection. And this is the differential we're trying to make. Here's a normal gallbladder, nice thin wall. Here's a chronic cholecystitis case. Thickened gallbladder wall, you can see this be very hard to fill this one. It won't expand very much. And here's acute cholecystitis with uh, inflammation uh, through the mucosa of the gallbladder wall and some gallstones remaining inside. Acute cholecystitis is what we're really fishing for with most of these HIDA scans. <laughs> and uh, you're going to see sometimes hyperemia of the liver and early in the study bordering the gallbladder fossa. The important thing though is the non-visualization of the gallbladder. That's the sine qua non of these studies. Um, some of them will show a rim sign. I'll talk about that in a second. <coughs> and some of, sometimes there's some gallbladder filling, but it's incomplete. And many of them are going to show reflux of the bile into the stomach. That's uh, seen very commonly in patients that don't have cholecystitis, uh, but it is a, um, uh, if you do, it's often a company. Here it is, here's acute cholecystitis. There's some reflux into the stomach right there. And now I don't know why this is doing it, because this was working. Uh, there's an, actually another image that's supposed to. There's another image that should turn up on the right. For some reason, it's, once you've hooked it up here, it's not coming up. Anyway, pretty much on the right-hand side, after morphine, and basically you see that there's no filling of the gallbladder. Uh, and this is a, a case of what we call liver scan appearance. Throughout the study, the trace was taken up in the liver, and it never leaves it. By the end of an hour of imaging, it's still all there. Nothing in the gallbladder, nothing in the small bowel either. This is called the liver scan appearance, and it indicates cholestasis. There's two kinds of cholestasis, intrahepatic and extrahepatic. But in either case, it's, it's one or the other. It could be hepatitis, intrahepatic, or it could be uh, high-grade obstruction of the common bile duct. Now, the rim side that the uh, activity surrounding the gallbladder, um, it can also be, it's not as specific as people, it can also be seen in chronic cholecystitis. Without, you see it early, it's uh, to, to I always say, case it's a surgical emergency. It means that the gallbladder not seen within an hour, um, that's a cynic one. Uh, it's not a sensitive finding. We typically will see also reversal of sequence in the order. I said gallbladder, well, they'll have bowel first, and then we give CCK as ejection fraction. I'm missing the comparative image here, but that's a uh, marking was <coughs> at the very end of the, there's uh, the gallbladder very nicely right there. Chronic acaphalus cholecystitis without as chronic inflammation, thickening the gallbladder wall, usually associated with stress, surgery, with CCK, and this um, with relief of symptoms after cystectomy. Uh, now, bilinesia is uh, something to fractions for. This is a, uh, an ejection fraction of less than 30 You give CCK, it should contract and a third of it uh, or more should be uh, uh, ejected. Uh, with a decrease in intensity, not necessarily the size of the gallbladder. There are different, there are um, a couple of causes for this. Biliary causes, well, which is what we call dyskinesia. There can be secondary biliary causes, which usually is cystitis. And then there can be a sphincter of OE itself. And this will be the sphincter of OD dyskinesia. It normally contracts uh, and, and, and relaxes. The next state is when you give uh, CCK, it opens when you, um, times it will have a tonic. Um, some patients have a paradoxical contraction when you give CCK, and so they have this uh, dyskinesia. Do that by doing the um, scan. <coughs> and here's an example of that. Um, this, uh, you, you'll see that the image. Keep a CCK in a gallbladder pretty same at the end. Other one, this is a normal case. Gallbladder looks like this one we gave CCK. This is completely uh, clear. Uh, 
This is a, uh, a bio-leak. Cholecystectomy patients sometimes have uh, uh, suspected bio-leaks. And so you start to see tracer here in the lower parts of the peritoneal cavity. Um, and that's, that's an abnormal finding. And you can see it sometimes going up the peritoneal gutter. You can sometimes see it coming down here. Um, this is the, uh, it's the same, uh, another patient. And put this patient in decubitus view, and you can see that this activity here all moved down here like that. So it will shift around. Okay, the next uh, main uh, topic is uh, liver function. And uh, this is an uh, Etruscan model of the liver. It was used in uh, fortune telling, looking for omens based on the uh, anatomy of the liver. A uh, liver function test, uh, there's quite, a, you know, we, we use them to evaluate liver function, but they're not actually very responsive to the immediate uh, status of the liver. It takes a while for these things to uh, develop. And actually what they are is measures of hepatic cellular damage, not actually liver function. Billy Rubin does uh, reflect the liver function, but it takes a long time. It lags well behind any changes in the liver, as do uh, other things like uh, um, uh, cholesterol and uh, you know, uh, times and so on. So um, we, can, we can look at liver function using the, the same height agent we use for the gallbladder. And if the hepatic uptake is delayed or hepatic excretion is delayed, then we can suspect that there are some problems with the liver. The liver scan appearance I've already shown you. Um, there are some people that are doing complicated uh, analysis, mathematical analysis on these scans. Um, it's not really found its way into clinical practice at this point. So we're basically just looking at the um, uh, way which you can see when you eyeball the scan. Things that can decrease hepatic uptake are, are manifold, uh, acquired hepatic disease itself, hepatitis, cirrhosis, drugs, neoplasm, biliary obstruction when it becomes chronic, and also chronic uh, metabolic diseases involving uh, biliary movement. Hemolysis can cause that as well. Uh, hepatic cirrhosis shows a decreased uh, early blood clearance rate, hepatic uptake is decreased, and hepatic excretion also decreased. You also may see some uh, inhomogeneity in uptake in the hepatic phase of the study. Uh, with chronic hepatitis, usually the hepatic uptake and clearance are fairly normal looking. Uh, focal nodular hyperplasia, sometimes we're asked to make the, help make this differential uh, when the MR findings are equivocal. Our sensitivity on uh, high scan is about 92%. It's, it's, it's pretty good. What we're going to see is increased perfusion on the flow phase, normal uptake initially, and then the tumors are actually going to appear during the clearance phase as the rest of the liver washes out. So they appear as hot areas um, in the scan. Usually uh, liver, uh, certainly metastatic liver tumors will, will not be, um, uh, would not show any activity on the HIDA scan, um, but uh, hep hepatomas will usually show decreased activity. Sometimes they can look normal, but they'll never be increased. So the only one that's increased is FNH, uh, and that's usually a slow, delayed increase. That just shows you a uh, uh, liver with uh, numerous, um, it's actually a cellular carcinoma with uh, intrahepatic nets. Uh, liver transplantation sometimes comes to us for evaluation of uh, problems. Uh, uh, they can be failure of the, the biliary anastomoses, rejection of liver, infection, and bile leaks. Uh, for rejection, uh, the HIDA scan shows can show normal or reduced uptake, either one. Hepatic clearance is usually what's uh, markedly delayed in these patients. Not a specific uh, finding, we don't really help with the diagnosis, but we can help for the evaluation of the monitoring of these patients as they uh, get therapy. Corollis disease, uh, multiple dilatations within the liver of uh, dilate at the biliary ducts. What we'll see, um, our, what we expect is the, is the focal areas of uh, tracer concentration within the liver, uh, multiple areas. Uh, it can be photopenic on the early part and fill in later, and then it may be uh, some delayed appearance of a small bowel. Colidocal cyst um, is a more solitary type of lesion in the bowel duct, and you can see prompt or delayed accumulation within the cyst depending on where it's located and how big it is and so on. Um, and it, it would generally fill later. We can see also non-visualization of the gallbladder in, in many of these cases. Neonatal hyperbilirubinemia, um, I won't say too much about it other than just uh, we can help to make a distinction between uh, biliary atresia, which is a surgically uh, uh, treatable form of this, and neonatal hepatitis, which is not surgical, it's uh, medical. And 
What we do is we uh, apply this whole thing to image the, the child uh, with the, uh, the height of agent, and you, sh you see whether there's anything at all that appears within the small bowel. If you see something in the small bowel, then it's going to indicate that it's, um, it's not biliary atresia. If you don't see something in the small bowel, it's not so specific, and it still could be either hepatitis or biliary atresia. Uh, and you can compare to cardiac activity if you want to get uh, precise about it. Okay, now to move on to another type of study. This is a very common study, gastric emptying. And the, um, the stomach has a very complex physiology once you ingest uh, food, whether it's solid or, or liquid, and, and there's differences between all of them. There's a pacemaker region here in the gastric um, body here, and it causes different types of contractions at different phases of time after, after you eat. And what we do, uh, uh, we, we basically give the patient a little bit of radio-labeled food. In our case, it's going to be uh, a, a whole egg, scrambled egg, with some sulfur colloid in it. And we simply then, the uh, patient eats that, and then we image the stomach for 90 minutes and see how much of that empties uh, and how much of it stays in there. There are artifacts you need to be concerned about, particularly the orientation of the stomach. It's not a flat, you know, horizontal or, or vertical type of uh, structure. It, it's it kind of oriented obliquely to all the planes. And so um, what we do generally at the Brigham is we do uh, anterior and posterior imaging, and then we do a geometric mean between the two. If you don't have a two-headed camera available, you can approximate that by just using the LAO view. But just don't an image in like the anterior view and think you're going to get accurate uh, results. The, another problem is that the small bowel, sometimes in the field of view, is going to be superimposed on the stomach, and that's going to add some counts to what we have. Uh, generally, like I said, we use a whole egg. Um, other people use ground beef, and, and uh, you can use, if the patient's receiving a formula through tube feeding, you can use that same formula to uh, approximate the, uh, the, the situation up on the floor. Normal emptying curve depends on whether you're giving solid or liquid. Liquid has a rapid exponential type of emptying. Solids have a more linear type of emptying after a short uh, gastric lag phase. Um, the lag phase can be abnormal in and of itself, and that could be the critical component. So we're still looking at that over here at, uh, at the Brigham. Um, and nothing definitive has been published on that yet, though. For us, anything, uh, if it takes more than 90 minutes for the, uh, for the half time, uh, gastric emptying, we consider that an abnormal study. Less than 90 minutes is normal. Usually for patients that are really healthy, uh, it'll be 60 minutes or less. A lot of things can affect the gastric emptying, however. Um, basically, uh, when, when you eat, there's feedback inhibition of gastric motility from duodenal receptors uh, for, uh, receptor for uh, protein and, uh, and fat and things like that. If you adjust a huge volume of material, you'll uh, also uh, empty slowly, uh, old age, nausea, stress, anxiety, pain, all these things can cause changes in the um, in the <coughs> evening. Also the time of day. So we do all our patients generally in the morning for this. Um, many, many drugs have effects on this. Um, so I won't go into this except just mention erythromycin as an uh, increase in the emptying rate. Although gastroparesis is a, is a decreased emptying for both solids and liquids, it's usually seen in patients that are diabetic or have some other sort of neurological disorder. Um, patients that have had surgery can have, uh, after uh, bagotomy, they can have decreased emptying with increased liquid emptying. Um, patients that have had antrectomy or partial gastrectomy or gastric bypass generally have increased emptying, rapid emptying of both solids and liquids. So here's an example. This is a normal case here. There was an abnormal here, which just shows that over time, um, there's not much clearance of anything out of the stomach. Okay, the next uh, category is GI bleeding. This is another fairly common indication. Uh, this is a patient with a uh, tumor. It's a bleeding from the tumors and carcinite uh, in the bowel. Uh, causes of GI bleeding are very manifold. We don't really have to evaluate what the cause is. We're just looking at the site. Well, so the two questions we want to identify, first of all, is there bleeding? Is the bleeding brisk enough uh, for the uh, for angiography to be able to uh, have a look at it? And then secondly, what is the site? Uh, minimal detectable re bleeding rate for us is about 0.1 cc's per minute. That's uh, about 10 times better than angiography. So if we don't see it, they never will. <coughs> 
because we do see it doesn't necessarily guarantee they will see it. Uh, we generally use at uh, the Brigham uh, tech labeled red blood cells. Um, this is pretty much standard everywhere. Oh, it was an earlier agent, has some good features, but um, generally the problem is that it's clear very rapidly from the blood pool, so if the bleeding isn't occurring exactly at the time of injection, you may get a negative study. Uh, we imaged in the anterior view for actually now maybe 60 minutes. We never found very much happening in the period between 60 and 90 minutes. Um, so, so sometimes we bring them down for delayed image, but uh, with the standard is now 60 minutes for us. Patient is supine. Uh, whole field of abdomen needs to be in the in, in the field of view. So that means from the diaphragm to the bladder, including the rectum behind the bladder. You have to make sure they're positioned correctly for that. Always interpret these studies from the cinematic images. <coughs> um, you can be fooled by just looking at, at, a, at a static image. Remember that blood is an irritant to the bowel and we usually migrate both anterograde and retrograde on these studies. So once it's gone on for a while, you may determine the bleeding site anymore and you just see blood filling the whole bowel. Um, like I said, these are the two questions you want to ask. Yeah. answer. Uh, so blood, bleeding, bear in mind that it's a dynamic process. It's something that takes time. So therefore, <laughs> it's not going to appear directly with the blood pool. So you see things that appear right away from hyperemia or congestion in the bowel or something. That is not bleeding. It takes time for the blood to get out of the circulatory system and enter the lumen of the bowel. So anything that you see in the first frame is probably not a bleeding site. Bleeding will increase over time, the tracer activity, and it's motile, like I said, once it gets in the bowel, there's peristalsis, it starts to move. It's also a focal process, so if it's involving whole big segments of the bowel, it's not a bleeding site either. And it's also usually intermittent. Which means that just because they tell you up on the floor of the patient, you know, hematocrit went down today um, to see bright red blood in the rectum, the patient comes up to the arse uh, sweet and uh, often they'll be completely negative. So you may have to repeat the study over time in order to really catch it. And uh, small bowel bleeding, you'll see um, a kind of wiggling because the small bowel is hanging on this mesentery, so it's free to move around as it undergoes peristalsis. That's an important factor helping you visualize it. Also, you sometimes see hairpin loops and multiple loops and a diagonal progression across the abdomen. These are all signs that you have a small bowel bleed. Large bowel is fixed to the uh, posterior uh, wall of the abdomen, and so therefore it doesn't have any wiggle, and it tends to you know, follow the, the, the typical peripheral uh, uh, track of the, uh, of the large colon. Positive, uh, false positive, you need to worry about penile blood pool in men. Very important, it sometimes looks like a rectal bleeding site because it's uh, vertical linear, uh, but it, you notice it will usually appear early, usually a static doesn't move around, and if you get a lateral view, you, you won't have any trouble determining uh, what it is. And this is just an example uh, of a rectal bleeding site. And for these, you always want to get a lateral view so that you can see that it's not actually in the bladder. Uh, here's the bleeding site at the paddock flexure. And that's the end of that. And another picture, this is from St. Petersburg, famous statue of Peter the Great overlooking the Neva River. Well, I think everybody deserves a fall. Objective. just do maybe three or four slides of some basic principles for you to make sure that we're all on the same page of what we're seeing. And uh, when you do, uh, in, in looking at perfusion imaging, the workhorse, of course, is going to be SPECT imaging. And the tracers that we use are uh, thallium and then technetium labeled tracers, either sestamibia or tetrophosmin. Obviously, the main things that you're looking at here uh, in terms of differences uh, Physical differences, as you know, thallium has a lower energy window compared to magnesium. That makes it less optimal for uh, SPECT imaging compared to magnesium labeled tracers. Um, the other characteristic that is very important is that uh, when you give thallium, uh, thallium is a potassium analog, so it will move in and out of the uh, cardiac cells uh, over time. With technetium labeled tracers, they don't redistribute, 
So once you inject them and they're up by the myocardium, they will pretty much stay there uh, until uh, you have uh, physical uh, decay of the radio tracer. As measures of uh, blood flow, thymium is uh, very good and these uh, tracers are only adequate because the extraction of the tracer at high flow rates is relatively modest. Uh, of course, because of the lower energy uh, window of thallium compared to sesamibi, you will tend to have more background. And the background is related to the increased uh, scatter uh, with thallium because the photons will tend to deflect more often than with technetium. So the target to background ratio is much better uh, with technetium tracers than with thallium. So this is overall why we chose to do technetium uh, tracers uh, in practice of nuclear cardiology. So, I'm going the wrong way. So again, uh, pointing out to the issue of extraction, here's a cur uh, the relationship between the extraction of the tracer in relation to blood flow. And the blood flow is expressed in milliliters per minute per gram. So you have one is essentially your resting flow. And three to four is how many times the resting flow will increase during an exercise or a stress test. And here you have the uh, uh, typical peak flows that you will see in lesions that are over 90% stenotic, 50%, and 0%. And here you have the ideal tracer will be the tracer that behaves like a red line, like uh, at any flow rate, all the tracer will be extracted. Now, in spect imaging, those tracers are less than ideal. Thallium has a curve that looks like this, so it, there has a, there's a significant less of a roll-off compared with magnesium sesamini, for example, that at high flow rates, uh, the tracer will be uh, extracted uh, less. And what are the implications of that? Well, if you have a patient with a 50% stenosis, for example, 50% uh, stenosis will have a peak flow of two. And then when you compare that stenotic region to the normal region, you will have uh, uh, this uptake. And so the difference between the normal and the abnormal zones will give you how, mu how much contrast you're really going to see on the pictures and whether or not you're going to be able to pinpoint a 50% stenosis. This, um, this doesn't happen with sesamibi. You see that the uh, roll-off in the extraction makes the appearance of the defect less apparent. And therefore, you have a lot more trouble identifying milder disease with, with uh, technetium tracers compared to uh, value. In terms of protocols, uh, the protocols are listed here. There's an uh, enormous uh, menu to choose from. Uh, I would stick only to the uh, technetium protocols, either single or dual or, or two-day protocols, single day or two-day. Uh, two-day protocols are usually reserved for patients that are very large and uh, in whom you need to give a high dose of the technetium tracer at rest and again during stress. And so the patient, the test is typically done in, in different days, could be 24 or more hours apart. Uh, both uh, images are gated, and uh, you can start with the stress, and the potential benefits of starting with the stress is that if it's normal, you don't really need to do the rest. Uh, but either way, you, uh, uh, either menu is fine. In single day protocols, it's for patients who are typically less than 200 pounds, and you do a low dose rest study first, uh, wait about 15 to 60 minutes for the tracer to clear from the blood pool and to give you optimal target to background ratio. You do your SPECT images and then prep the patient for the stress and do a high dose of the isotope to uh, usually we triple the dose we gave at rest to make sure that we overwrite the counts that are residual from the resting scan. Uh, and you could also essentially uh, use the low dose with the stress and then do the high dose with the rest. Though the disadvantage of this protocol uh, is that the low dose will be uh, injected for the most important picture, which is the stress picture. So we typically, most of the labs will do low dose rest, high dose stress images. Uh, in terms of stress testing, the, there's only one thing you need to remember. And and this is important in interpretation, not just in the uh, 
uh, in the theory of, of what's in uh, the perfusion images. But what you want is enough flow heterogeneity in the myocardium to be able to pinpoint a normal zone from an abnormal zone, okay? And the only way to be able to detect the two is to have enough contrast between the two lesions. And enough contrast gives you, um, uh, uh, you know, uh, the defect becomes very apparent. What happens if you have a submaximal stress in the normal zone, this area will be uh, more pale, so that uh, you have a blunted increase in flow here, and it will be less apparent the distinction between the normal and the abnormal zones, and we'll talk about that when we go to the case. So the pragmatic approach is that always do exercise because it's better, it's more physiologic, uh, but we need to avoid some maximal exercise. And so if the patient is unable to attain a maximal stress, then we switch to pharmacological stress. We don't inject the patient at peak stress. And, uh, and for pharmacological stress, we typically prefer vasodilators, adenosine or diprethamol, and essentially when these are contraindicated, we go to we get to the cases now, and we're going to try to apply this one minute 101 review on perfusion imaging on the, on the actual cases. So this is a typical patient that came for uh, diagnosis, so no prior history of coronary disease. The patient exercised for 10 minutes, over 10 minutes on the Bruce protocol, had a negative uh, ECG and clinical response, that is no chest pain and no ECG changes. And something we always look at, and even though you're concentrating on your images, I want you to always pay attention to these values here. What was the peak heart rate that the patient was able to achieve? And that is expressed typically as a percentage of the maximum for the patient's age. And then we pay attention to this RPP, the rate pressure product, is the, is the product between the peak heart rate and the peak systolic blood pressure. And this gives you a non-invasive approximation to how much oxygen demand was imposed on the heart muscle. And you want to see this number over 25,000. Anything less than 25,000 is going to be a submaximal stress. Okay, so this is the first study. And uh, here, you always start, you have to be systematic. For those of you who are going to take the boards, the best thing to do is to be very systematic. You first want to see the raw data. And the raw data here is you have press images on the top and the rest images at the bottom. And there are a few things that you want to focus. Number one, you want to see that the heart moves across a horizontal without too much of a dip. And here you have a little no motion at rest. You also want to see the lungs and see if the lungs are filled up uh, during the stress readings, uh, particularly uh, now, once you are done with the review of the raw data, then you move on to the images. And essentially, uh, well, here, uh, the images, even though there are peaks, here on the uh, images that are reversed for walls. Systematic review, you want to follow first the apex on the vertical long axis, and then go to the short actual face on the other um, axis. And essentially, uh, here we are concerned about perhaps mild ischemia in the inferior wall. Uh, these are the gated images. The gated images in this case are normal. These are the stress and these are the rest images. <coughs> and you can see that there's good thickening. However, the defect was reversible. So in this case, the gated images are not going to help out in distinguishing whether what we're seeing is artifact or real. And now we repeated the study. The patient now didn't move, and you see that it's complete normalization of the trace of distribution. So a lot of attention needs to be paid to the raw data because what you say on the uh, images is going to be reflecting uh, a, a reflection of uh, the quality of the raw data. So, so again, motion is something you always need to look for because it's the number one source of artifacts on spec imaging. This will be another case. Now, in this case, um, you have a 67 year that has known coronary disease, has atypical chest pain as the presentation, uh, is also an exercise stress test. Again, looking at our parameters, the patient had no chest pain, 
had no ECG changes, but the workload was submaximum, 34% of the patient's max. We want to see this number above 85%, and this RPP was lower than 25,000. Again, these are the images. Look at the raw data. There's a little vibration, less jerky motion than before. He's a male patient, and you see inferior wall defect here on the images showing apparent reversibility, and you can see that on the vertical long axis views, the ratio between the anterior wall and the inferior wall getting better. So the question is, is this a real defect, and is this reflective of ischemia in the inferior wall? Gated images, again, any time you're dealing with reversible defect, don't look for help on the gated images. It's not going to be helpful. And the reason why it's not going to be helpful is because the stress gating occurs 30 minutes after you injected this tracer <coughs> at peak stress. And even though the perfusions uh, images are reflecting the perfusion state at the peak exercise, the gated images are reflecting cardiac function at the time you're actually acquiring the images, which is 30 minutes post-exercise. And typically, you could have transient ischemia, which is no longer affecting cardiac function 30 minutes later. So now, what we do, we prompt the patient. Every time you see a defect in the inferior wall, particularly when it's mild to moderate in severity, what you can do is just to prompt the patient. And the idea with proning is that the heart will lean forward because of gravity and will separate the inferior wall from the diaphragm. And when you do that, you will dramatically increase the counts in the inferior wall, you can see that it's a perfectly normal scan in a patient that we suspected had evidence of ischemia there. So again, uh, motion, source of artifact, I think are <clears throat> another important source of false positives. Another patient, this is a diagnostic study. Patient's 56, non-anginal chest pain, but no prior cardiac history. Uh, workload is maximal. Here you have, even though the patient walked for 12 minutes, and eat only a submaximal stress with no uh, chest. And what do you have? This is a female patient. And in fact, they're trying to identify where the breast shadow is in relation to the heart. And here's not self-evident, but this is something you definitely need to look on the images. There's a very uh, modest insinuation of the breast shadow here, uh, and but you essentially have a, a defect here in the anteroapical wall, which appears to be fixed, right? And this is evident here. Uh, the appearance of breast artifact is very uh, important. Uh, they typically spare the apex of the heart. It stays within the mid to apical anterior wall, spares the septum. So typically, uh, you will have a hard time matching the defect to an normal distribution of a coronary artery, in this case, the LAD. Now, in this case, looking at gating, really, because if you have a fixed defect and the gating shows normal uh, contraction and normal thickening of the anterior wall, you know that it's not an infarct. It's actually an attenuation artifact. So again, the distinction of how the gating will help you, it will not help you when you see reversible ischemia. Don't look for help there but it will help you if the defect is fixed. So if the defect is fixed and you have a wall motion abnormality, you know you're dealing with prior scar. Okay, another case, 58-year-old male, uh, has coronary disease, has a prior uh, revascularization procedure. Now it's asymptomatic, but comes for post-PCI evaluation. Uh, underwent exercise, Bruce Burkle, nine minutes, has a hypertensive response to ice, diastolic blood pressure goes up, the patient had chest pain, but no ECG changes, and the test was actually also submaximal. All right, so here we are. Uh, we have a uh, raw data. Raw data shows uh, it's Pretty good, there's a little bit of a, a jerky motion here in the middle of the acquisition. It's better at rest. And the images are uh, showing essentially a little bit of a defect here in the inferoceptum and the inferior wall, okay? But 
the fact is that it shows some reversibility. And you're always concerned about these patients because they, they, we know they have coronary disease. Again, reversibility, gain, you're gonna look at it, but it's not gonna help you. And again, prone helps you. Now, what happens when you prone somebody? It says, well, you know, why don't we prone everybody and just be done with it? Well, the problem when you prone a patient is that you're also going to tend to see a defect in the anterior wall. Because now the anterior wall is against the table, and the table uh, produce a, some attenuation in the anterior wall. And also in female patients, it might get worse because you have the breast and the table. So if you did prone uh, to begin with, uh, you might see a defect that looks like this. In this case, you're comparing prone on the stress with supine on the rest, and this is not the proper way. So you need to have the supine images uh, and the prone if you suspect an inferior wall artifact. So on the prone, going back, <clears throat> on the prone, we saw that the anterior wall looks pretty good. But then uh, we go to the, uh, uh, I mean, the supine, it was good. The prone, then we're sure that this is an attenuation artifact, even though it looks like it is reversible here. So if you're going to do prone and compare that to a supine rest, you're also going to have to have the supine stress. I hope I didn't confuse you. But, uh, the point here is that when you do prone, uh, you would tend to see some reduction in counts in the anterior wall, which you need to be aware of. Another potential source of artifact is a patient with a heart transplant comes for the annual evaluation looking for coronary disease. Good exercise, no chest pain, no ECG changes. And you get a scan that looks like this. So what you would notice here is that the arms of the patient are down, not up. The typical uh, imaging for cardiac, again, at least the left arm needs to be out of the field of view. What happens when you have the arm in the field of view, you will tend to have uh, defects that are um, at the inferolateral or the lateral wall and the anterior septal wall. So it looks like 180 degrees in diagonal like this. Now in this patient, you have the lateral wall that so looks like there's a defect and then at rest it improves. And to compare this on the horizontal views that you can see this more, uh, is more evident here, the lateral thumb as a defect and then it gets better at rest. So this is a reversible defect. To what extent this defect is a reflection of the arm in the field of view? Well, one reassuring aspect is that the arm was also in the field of view and because the resting study has a low dose of the isotope, if, if anything, we should have seen worsening of this pattern at rest because there's more attenuation. Uh, so it is a reversible defect. What happens? Uh, again, the gating would not help you. Uh, one particular aspect of this cardiac motion is that you see that the symptom doesn't move all that much. It's all the work provided by the lateral wall. This is what we call paradoxical septal motion. And this is typical for patients who had prior open heart surgery. Because of the pericardium being open, you have a different pattern of synchrony. It looks like, uh, sometimes looks like a, a bundle. You can see this uh, paradoxical subtle motion, but the point here is that when you re-image the patient with the arms up, the defect is still there, and you can still uh, see uh, evidence of ischemia in the lateral wall. Let's compare these to another patient. Arms down here, and now you have a defect right here, right? And this is the typical that you would see: inferolateral anterior defect. Uh, perhaps a little bit of reversibility here uh, and the fixed anterior subtle defect. And again, these are challenging studies to interpret. And then arms, it changes completely. Now we see that the patient has uh, a fixed defect in the inferior wall, right? But no, no longer uh, do you see a defect here in the inferior lateral wall. So again, the typical pattern of diaphragmatic attenuation, and we saw the gating, the gating was normal. So we conclude that the study is negative for ischemia, and that, uh, and that, the, uh, that it was a most likely uh, a soft tissue attenuation. So 
The point here is, again, pay a lot of attention to the details provided on the raw data. When you're presented with a scan, don't look at the images until you're sure you know what happened during the acquisition. Uh, look for motion, look for the brush shadow on the stress images, look for uh, the position of the arm, and look for extra cardiac sources of, uh, of tracer uptake. All of those things we're going to give you clues to then go to the uh, scan and do a proper interpretation. Now, how do we avoid false negative scans? And again, these are tricky things to deal with. Uh, this is a uh, patient with coronary disease, comes for dyspnea evaluation, has an adenosine uh, test, which we added a little bit of an exercise you know, with the adenosine co combination. Again, with uh, pharmacological stress, is really not uh, the same as when you evaluate an exercise stress test because pharmacological stress, particularly vasodilators, uh, the, the changes in cardiac work do not reflect the change in myocardial perfusion because essentially when you give a vasodilator, flow increases in the myocardium irrespective of the changes in blood pressure and heart rate. So it's, it's not like exercise that flow increases because the blood pressure and the heart rate increase, okay? So don't get fooled with looking at this when you're dealing with a vasodilator stress because it's not gonna help you. Uh, this is the scan of this patient. Look at the raw data. Again, arms are up, lungs look pretty good. The heart did not appear to move, both images. And the scan looks like pretty benign. Maybe somebody could suggest that there's something here, but essentially it's a probably normal scan. Now, um, the physicians or the referring physicians were sus suspicious that this patient would, uh, uh, had a dyspnea equivalent. So they said, no. Nah -uh. So they sent the patient again and says, please do a dobutamine stress this time. And uh, he did a dobutamine. The patient dropped the ST segment uh, during the uh, dobutamine infusion, even though the patient had no chest pain, just dyspnea. And these are the scans in this patient. You see the patient, now you see a large area of ischemia in the ear and anterolateral walls. There's a change in cavity size. You see that the cavity gets bigger with the stress. So all signs of significant ischemia. Uh, again, when you do vasodilator stress, it's pretty tricky to determine whether or not the patient had a submaximal stress. And because of the submaximal stress, you're missing ischemia and the scan is a false negative. So how do you deal with that? Well, the best way you can do, deal with that is to make sure uh, somebody talks to the patient and screens the patient all the things that can block the effects of vasodilators like caffeine intake and things like that. So patient preparation here is extremely important. And this is the way it works. Uh, when you give adenosine, uh, adenosine, what, what it will do is it will increase the blood concentration of adenosine which is a naturally occurring uh, substance uh, from the breakdown of ATP. Adenosine, what it does is it uh, binds to these receptors which are called adenosine receptors. And the adenosine receptors are present in almost all the cardiac tissues. But the ones who we're particularly interested in are those that are called adenosine 2A receptors that are in the coronary vasculature. And what happens is when adenosine binds to it produces smooth muscle relaxation and vasodilatation. Okay, now what happens when you have caffeine that can block uh, adenosine uh, binding? Essentially, you will increase the adenosine concentrations, but the adenosine will not be able to bind to the tissues and you will be unable to produce patients. So, bottom line is make sure you screen potential medications that interfere with adenosine action and for. Um, beverages or food that contains caffeine. And this is a more quality control step that needs to be done before the test is actually performed. This is another patient, now 59 male, prior uh, um, uh, coronary disease, post revascularization, comes with an atypical chest pain. And this is the extra, and patient walked for only four minutes, or almost four minutes, had some shortness of breath. The blood pressure response was blunted the peak heart rate response was about 55% of max, so it's way below the 85% that we want to see. 
and a rate pressure product because the blood pressure response was blunted it was very low. This is almost a resting rate pressure product. So there's minimal. And when you look at the scan, you get something like this. Again, looking at the images, some degree of lung uptake, you can see it here, delineation of the lungs in relation to the heart. They seem to have at least moderate uptake. Uptake in the muscles, but good quality scan. And the scan shows very modest defect here in the lateral wall showing reversibility, so you would conclude that there's mild ischemia in the circumflex fusion. Now, what happened is that the patient had a very low workload, so the defect is going to be as severe as the increases in oxygen demand on the heart. So now you repeat this with the denosine, because the patient uh, wasn't able to sustain a maximal stress, and now the defect becomes more apparent. Uh, and now you're sure that uh, there is a critical stenosis in the circumflex territory. So, so this is what I meant before. Heterogeneity of blood flow. Avoid submaximal stress tests because you're going to lead to either underestimating the severity of coronary disease or missing CAD altogether. So again, even though you're a radiologist, you're going to be looking at the images, make sure that the exercise and the stress information is available to you at the time you make your interpretation. So then, for your scan, you, you, you dealt with the, the, the defect real, that you excluded the possibility that your scan is a false negative, then you say, well, I need to be able to localize the coronary disease. I need, need to be able to help the referring physician uh, tell you which is the culprit vessel and which vessel you go after. This is a 61-year-old male, again, prior coronary disease. The patient is asymptomatic, but comes for pre-operation had an adenosine stress test, and you get a scan like this. Well, uh, you see a large perfusion defect, which is very severe in the anterior and septal walls, and also in the apex. All of it is uh, showing complete reversibility. And again, this will be the pattern of the LAD left anterior descending coronary territory. Every time you see anterior, anterolateral, apical wall, and septum, you think of LAD, okay? That's important. Not only that to describe, in, in the body of your report, you're going to so and so involved in this wall, but in the impression, you're going to say there's a large, the beyond, we help in them, uh, figure be worried about. This is another case, non in a woman with risk factors, and that was assessed, and you get a defect like that. Now you're talking about the infidel lateral wall of the heart, showing reverse, and this would be more typical for the obtuse marginal distribution. And the clues to differentiate obtuse marginal from the right coronary artery is that, um, well, we could be the right coronary. It's a difficult area, and the clues that you would look for are, is the inferior septum at the base involved in the defect or not? If it is, like in this case, you lean more to the posterior descending, whether that, whether that arises from the circumflex or the right coronary, it doesn't matter. You refer to the defect as PDA, posterior descending artery. In this case, I misspoke, you know, I said it was marginal, but in looking at the base of the heart, here the, the inferior septum of the base is involved, so it is likely to be a PDA. Whether this is a left or right dominant system, it doesn't matter. Okay? You don't refer to it as right coronary territory. You refer to it as PDA. Um, another case, uh, prior MI, <coughs> and the defect looks like this. Now you're pretty sure this is the PDA. It does defeat your septum at the base. Notice that the septum is paired at the apex because the way the septum receives the blood supply is the Mid and distal thirds are all supplied by the septal branches from the LAD. And it's only at the base of the septum that the PDA supplies that particular wall. So every time you see inferior septum with inferior wall, you're pretty sure it's going to be the PDA. If you only see the inferior lateral wall or the base of the inferior wall without septum, it's most likely to be obtuse marginal. And then you want to make a very good description of 
the extent and the severity of the defect because those parameters have a lot to um, um, a lot of information regarding the risk of that particular scan for the patient. Uh, you look at the, there's significant lung uptake here, so this is uh, a sign of a high risk scan. Then you look at the image and the cavity looks larger on the stress compared to the rest. So the DID, there is lung uptake, and there are multiple perfusion defects involving the LID. Here you have anterior and lateral here, shown with reversibility. So there's ischemia in the LID, but there's also ischemia in the other territory here of this marginal circumflex distribution. And so this is a patient with high risk features. There is lung uptake, there's TID, and there are multiple perfusion defects. And you want to definitely call the scan severe. The risk with the scan is very high. So, so again, making a statement on your report regarding uh, the, um, uh, the risk is, is, is important. Uh, just a word on myocardial viability, and I'm just going to show you pictures. Uh, the way we address myocardial viability in most centers is using PET imaging, even though the spec continues to be an option. Uh, with PET imaging, the workhorse of viability is FDG, and the patterns you're looking for is the typical classic mismatch when perfusion is reduced, but FDG is preserved. And this mismatch between perfusion and metabolism is the equivalent of this hibernating myocardium that we're looking for, and is highly predictive of improvement in ventricular function following revascularization. So, so you definitely want to be uh, looking for this. You want to be as quantitative as possible, and there are multiple ways of doing that. But the bottom line, you want to know how big and extensive what that was that area of particular mismatch. And you have the other pattern. This is a patient with a lot of, here you have stress study, the rest studies here. This is the uh, FDG, there's stress, rest perfusion, and then FDG in vertical long axis views, and here in the horizontals, and essentially what you see is the stress images show a very large defect, is fixed at rest, so there's no residual ischemia in territories outside of the infarct zone, and the FDG shows essentially a matching pattern compared to the perfusion, uh, and the matching pattern is synonymous of SCAR. And again, showing the quantitative aspect of the SCAR, very extensive. And so maybe next year we'll talk about the future of IAC imaging, which is going into you know combination of PET-CT or potentially SPEC-CT, looking at perfusion, looking at uh, viability, perfusion, uh, looking at the addition, inf additional information from CT, looking at uh, the extent of SCAR, function and potentially uh, coronary anatomy. Thank you very much.